Hi everybody, I'm Don Dixon. I want to welcome you to our master class on the mechanics of fishing. In our earlier discussions, we sort of eliminated some of the things that we thought might be controls in fishing and we ended up with depth of our lure and the speed of our lure as the two most important things that we need to control once we get out there on the water. And we gave a couple of examples of speed control to show you some of the extremes of how slow it can be at times and then how fast it could be on the other side of the fence. So we set up these parameters and ended up with a conclusion that no matter what day you're going fishing, you can't ever know exactly what the proper speed control is going to be. You're going to have to test the different types of speed until you arrive at what's going to uh, do the trick for that particular day. So it's something that we're always checking. We have an idea what it might be through our knowledge of the lake type and of knowledge of the seasonal movements and the weather and water conditions, the time of the year, all of those things. It'll give us an idea of speed. But in the end, we'll never know for sure, so we have to check it out. And then we arrived, the last time we talked, at the number one control in fishing, which is depth. And we're expanding on that by telling you and sharing a couple of examples of what Buck really meant when he talked about depth control. It seems like a very complicated sort of discussion when, when you read in Buck's material and the advanced material. Sometimes people don't get it. Even some of the old timers that have been around me for a long time don't seem to get this one. When they say depth control, and normally they're just thinking in terms of a specific depth. Taking a specific lure, uh, like a 100 spoon plug to 15 feet, that's what they're thinking of in depth control. But Buck meant a lot more than that when he talked about depth control. Today I'm going to give you an example of something that triggered in my mind this entire meaning that we've just been discussing. What Buck talked about what depth control really is and what it meant, what he meant when he's talked about depth control. It triggered it for me. So I hope by telling you this story, it'll trigger it for you and you'll see the, you'll see the connection. Now this particular story happened in 1978 and some of you have been around me for quite a while. I've heard this story. I wrote about it once. I, I did a radio interview with it once. So if you've already heard it, I'm sorry, i got to tell it. And for those of you who haven't heard it, uh, here it goes. Happened in 1978. But I, I, let, me, let me go back for a minute. If you've already heard the story, don't shut me off. Because I want you to hear it again, but hear it in the sense of what we're talking about today. What speed control? How speed control? Where speed control? Why speed control? Et cetera, et cetera. I want you to think about it in these terms as we go through this story. So hopefully you're going to have the picture in the end like I had in the end. This is what Buck meant when he talked about depth control. All right. 1978, working for Buck. Tommy and I both working for Buck at that time. He got a phone call and he was invited or invited to send some representatives of his. And really Tommy and I were it. We were the his only representatives. Uh, to send somebody, if he couldn't make it, to come in and fish the very first Muskies Incorporated Muskie Tournament. It was a national, actually it was an international tournament. Guys were invited from all over the world to come to this thing. If you were a muskie hunter, uh, you were invited to come to this first ever Muskies Inc. Tournament. Now, back in those days, uh, it was a little bit different and Buck wanted us to fish this particular one because they allowed trolling. Well, all of a sudden now somebody's allowed trolling. The musky guys allow trolling. So Buck says, it'd be fun to go out and fish that thing. He said, and if you just place, he said, we can use it, you know, to help, you know, sort of uh, promote our, you know, our educational material and what we're trying to teach people. Uh, it'd be good. You, you wouldn't have to win, you just have to place. And it would be a good thing. So, Tommy and I looked at each other. Well, you know, we were interested in education. We weren't interested in fishing tournaments. But, what Buck says, that's what we did. So we said, okay. Now, at that point, Buck told me something, and I, and I have to put a little humor in this. 
uh, in this story because there was some humor involved in it. But I want to keep in mind, too, the edu educational message that it is. But uh, part of the humor was Buck says, now I want you to go out there incognito. He said, I don't want you to let everybody know that you're, you know, work for me and all of that. And he said, I don't want, and at the time, Buck was educational editor of Fish and Facts magazine. And his story it really had started to grow, you know, yeah, hundreds of thousands of people were being enlightened to the, to, to the truth about fishing. So it, things were taken off and the reputation was great. Well, for some reason, he thought maybe if we announced who we were and didn't do well, that would detract from all of the positive things that was happening. I don't know what he was thinking, but he said, I want you to go incognito. I don't want you to tell anybody who you are. He says, I want you to wear jeans and a t-shirt. And I looked at him, I said, Buck, that's all I ever wear. Jeans and a t-shirt, cowboy boots. <laughs> so we laughed about that for a while. I said, okay, I'll go incognito. So Tommy and I are supposed to wear jeans and t-shirts and that's all Tommy ever wore. I mean, it was funny. He, he didn't want anybody to know, quote, who we are. Well, back in those days, in those early days, nobody knew who we were. Nobody cared. Unless we were doing a specific promotion somewhere, nobody knew who we were. I mean, we had no national, you know, recognition of any sort back then. At any rate, I had written, as a field editor, I had written a couple of stories for Fishing Facts. And one of them happened to be a muskie story. So that's going to lead into part of my story here. There were two guys to a boat, but you could fish with your own partner. Uh, so uh, that, that was a no-brainer for us. We were just going to take one of our boats out. We ended up taking my boat out there. And uh, we were uh, going to fish together, of course. And they told us in this information that there were 250 anglers that were fishing in this tournament. That's a bunch. That's a big bunch. Well, it was a big reservoir. It, it, the name of the reservoir was Palm de Terre. It had two big arms. Uh, one was the Palm de Terre River, and then there was another arm. I think it was, uh, I believe it was Lindley Creek. You created this other arm, and they all come down. And they met at the dam. These these two big arms, and uh, so that was the reservoir. And we didn't know a thing about it. We'd never fished out there, and uh, so. We were, we were all set. We did our packing. You know, we had, <laughs> we was easy packing. T-shirt and jeans. That was it. So we go out there and they had seven different marinas that were set up where all of these fishermen all were assigned to a specific marina. And at the marina, uh, there was the hotel reservations at, at the marina. So Everybody had their assigned places where they were to stay. And the one that we were assigned to was down near the dam, which was where everything was happening from. That was the headquarters down by the dam. So I said to Tommy, before we even check in, I got to get something to eat. And there was a, there was a restaurant right there at the marina. So it was a little diner kind of place, you know. So we rolled in there and sat up at the counter. And there was nobody behind the counter. There was no waiter or waitress or anything. So... We sat there for just like a minute or two, and we were about ready to leave and go out and find some other place where we might get something to eat. And here a guy come walking around uh, out of the kitchen, I guess, and, and he walked, and the first thing he did when he walked around the corner, he said, Holy mackerel, Don Dixon, how are you doing, man? I, I didn't know you were coming to this deal. Man, I'm so excited. And so all of a sudden, the incognito was right out the door. Here I am, all haggard looking, you know, I had a beard on and, you know, my jeans and t-shirt. The first guy I come across knows who I am. Not only knows me, but knows my name. And that surprised me and Tommy, because really, nobody really knew who we were. And he said, man, I read Fishing Facts all the time. And it was just, I think, two or three months previous to that, I had written an article of Kinzu Reservoir in Pennsylvania. And it, it was a musky story. And he said, man, I, I read your story a couple of months ago of Fishing Facts. He said, I recognize you anywhere. So <laughs> all of a sudden, my, my incognito was out the window. We were recognized. So now pressure was on. We're going to have to probably do fairly well or at least make some sort of a statement because 
Now, uh, Buck's fear has been realized. They know we're there. So, he then goes on to tell us, he said, oh, by the way, there are seven marinas. A lot of people have been spending about three years putting this thing together. He said, and I'm the director of it all. He said, and on Friday night after the practice day, and this was on Thursday when we rolled in there. So he said, on Friday night after the practice day tomorrow, he said, Friday night, we're going to meet in the high school gymnasium. And he said, I've got some of the musky stars, uh, well-known musky writers and musky hunters, and some of the guys have written for Fish and Facts. So a lot of well-known uh, musky hunters were coming to this tournament. It was a pretty big deal. Now, there wasn't a lot of money involved. In fact, back then they said, we're just going to be given prizes like boats and motors and, and canoes and trolling motors and, and gas motors and, and uh, depth signers, stuff like that. But it was more of a prestige thing. Who's going to win the very first Muskies Inc. tournament? International tournament. They made a big deal about it. And the whole reason behind the tournament being set up in the first place was that they had stocked muskies into that reservoir in, I think it was 1966 or 68, <coughs> excuse me, 10 or 12 years prior to us being there for this tournament, they had stocked muskies into this reservoir. And their plan was, their overall plan was to create what, in their mind, they could visualize the muskie capital of the South, Palm de Terre. Okay. So we had the history of the lake. But we didn't know a thing about the lake. But he's telling us about this Friday night meeting. Uh, and he said a lot of the guys have brought their wives and some have brought kids. So there's going to be about 400 people. And he said, we have scheduled four of the top muskie hunters in the country to speak at this thing Friday night after dinner. He said, listen, I didn't know you were coming. Man, he said, you have got to be the keynote speaker Friday night. You gotta, you gotta get up and tell, oh no, I'm going, and I tried everything I could do to get out of that. Not that I'm shy. Most of you know I'm not shy. You start, you start a conversation with me, it'll be two hours later, you're trying to figure out a way to get rid of me. We're talking about fishing. So it's not, it had nothing to do with being shy, but now, not only did he recognize me, but he wants me to introduce me and get me in front of 400 people. So now everybody knows. I'm a representative of Buck Perry. So then the pressure will really be on. It's exactly what Buck did not want. So I couldn't figure out a good way of getting out of it. I told him, listen, I don't want to step on anybody's toes. You know, you've already scheduled these guys. He said, well, we'll let them speak, but I want you to end up speaking. You be the final speaker or the first speaker, even be better. Okay. I didn't know what else to do. So I said, okay, I'll do it. He said, it's just, you know, if you just do 10 minutes or so, it'd be great. I said, okay, all right, I'll do it. Because he wasn't going to let me off the hook. He, he, was, he was determined. So, okay. So we go out on the practice day. I'm going to back up a little bit now before I get to that story. Back up a little bit. We go on practice day. We've never seen this lake. We do have a map of it. And down in the damn area where we're launching, there's a lot of great looking structure. I mean, it's picture book stuff. I mean, it's gorgeous. And you just know there's got to be, you know, 14 break, breaks on, break lines on each structure dropping down into 90 feet of water. I mean, it looks terrific. So we couldn't wait to get out there the next day because that's what we do, you know, and that's what we like anyhow. So we can't wait to see what this reservoir, what, what makes it tick, you know. But when we saw what kind of terrain it was in, we were a little bit concerned about what kind of watercolor we might have down in this dam area where all this gorgeous structure was. Well, we got out on the lake. First thing we found out was there was a weed line to about 20 feet. Now, most of you who've been with me for a while and, and since we actually started our vlogs, you know what that means. That means that water was gin clear. We had clear water. Clear water, maximum light penetration, deep fish, colder the water, the more dormant they're likely to be. So we don't like clear water. 
We didn't like it. When we, as soon as we put the boat in, we didn't like it. And oh, by the way, while we were putting the boat in, now something else hit us. Here we are in our little 14-foot boat with a little engine on the back. And here are all these musky hunters from all over. You know, most of them from up north, Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, Minnesota. You know, the, the musky guys. Uh, North Dakota. <laughs> I don't want to forget those guys. Uh, and they show up. They're all launching a boat same time we launch. They've got the equivalent of the Bass Pro kind of bass boats today in bass fishing. These northern guys, they got the equivalent. They got like 21 and 23 foot lungs, these big huge lungs, you know, with 250 horsepower, 150 horsepower, you know, big engine and stuff. We're launching our little 14 foot Alumacraft. <laughs> with our little teeny engine and we look like we don't belong there we already look like buck didn't have to worry about the jeans and the t-shirt thing we don't look like we belong period and all of these guys back then they all had these suits on you know with all the different patches of all their accomplishments and all of this i mean we felt pretty ridiculous but yet we knew everybody was going to know who we were so in the back of our minds, he taught me and I didn't even talk about it, but we knew that we were going to have to catch a fish or two. We were going to have to have some sort of result or it wasn't going to be pretty. And Buck really was going to be disappointed. And, and above everything else, we never wanted to disappoint Buck. So we already did in a sense because we've been recognized. So all of a sudden, we get out there and we see all this clear water. And I said to Tommy, I said, buddy, I said, it's so clear we know all these guys are going to be chunking these big baits up in all of this beautiful weed line and with this clear water we're going to have to find some color and we had these two arms so we had to figure that it was like a upside down wishbone here which one are we going to go up well the palm to tear arm uh, and looking at the map, it appeared as though it was about 20, 25 miles of river, of, of, of reservoir. And the Lindley Creek arm looked like it was more like 15 miles, maybe 17 miles. So it was shorter. <coughs> Excuse me. Now to get to the upper reaches to try to find better watercolor, you know, that's one of our keys in a, in a highland type situation, clear water situation when fishing a reservoir, you need to move further towards the headwaters. Now this was the end of September, I believe it was, and the fish weren't in any strong fall pattern yet. It's still summer pattern stuff. But with all the clear water, we knew we had to, we needed to find some water color. We needed to find a place where we had some color so that we might be able to have a little shallower movement of a fish uh, in order to be successful. So. We, we flipped a coin. I said, we could flip a coin, which we did. And then I had second thoughts and I said, you know, because the Lindley Creek deal is so much shorter, let's run up there first because we're working with a little boat and a little motor. I said, I don't want to spend a whole bunch of time running any more than we have to. So let's go up the Lindley Arm. So we did. So I start running up there and now this is a practice day, but we don't have a lure in the water. We're not putting any lures in the water. We're look, we know what we got to do. We got to find some water color. It's clear as a bell. I mean, it's what Buck calls drinking water. Uh, if he'd launch his boat in a place like that, he wouldn't even launch his boat. He'd get out of the truck, look at it, turn around, get back in the truck and leave. He would not fit. It's gin clear. So I said, we're going to go until we find some color. That's our, that's our chance. So we never put a lure in the water. We just kept traveling. We go about five miles, looking around, the color's still the same. It's gin clear. So we kept on going, kept on going. Every couple of miles, we'd take a look. And finally, about 10 or 12 miles up that reservoir, we came to a side feeder stream cut that came out and met, is a big side feeder cut, that came out and met uh, Lindley Creek. And it created a bar. This bar was created uh, where two deep bodies of water meet. Very common. But as we were approaching it, we saw the point of land, and we saw the separation there of the two streams, and I thought, 
Maybe we'll have some color. Well, we didn't go but another 20 or 30 yards, and we started noticing a little different watercolor. The closer we got to that junction, the better that color started looking on the side feeder stream cut. So by the time we got up to the bar, we saw the structure and we mapped that structure pretty quick. We did a quick mapping of it. We just, still, we're not doing any fishing. And we did a little map of that thing and, and the side feeder stream cut was a good drop off, a good break line. Uh, the rest of the bar was pretty steep, pretty narrow and pretty steep and, and not necessarily to my liking. So I said, let's run this break line on the side feeder stream cut. And let's roll up in there a ways, because it was a big cut, reaching way back in there, you know. So I said, let's just follow that up, see if we can't continue to get better watercolor and make sure we still have the depth in, in the side feeder stream. So as we check this drop off, it's breaking at 45 feet and it's breaking sharp. It's breaking nice into 70 feet of water. So we still had lots of depth, which of course we're looking for a muskie. We got to have some deep water, period. So I'm following this 45 foot break line. Now we're not fishing. I'm just following it to see where it goes, see how it turns, see, see, see what we can see. All of a sudden, I hit a spot where, you know, and I was just following that break line. And all of a sudden, I mean, it, it was just like falling off the Empire State Building, just pow. You know, it was 45 and before I could even move, I was in 70, 70 feet of water. Before I could even turn the boat even just a little bit, it broke really sharp. So I stopped. I got out the map of the lake. We had a contour map. And sure enough, when I looked at where we were, those contour lines came real close together right at one spot. And I mean from the shallows to the 45 foot drop off to the 70 feet was like a half a cast. It was like right now, pow. Now, we haven't talked about sharper breaks. I think I mentioned it once in our structure discussion. What I'm talking about is the suddenness of a break. Some places, you know, it's breaking like this. At one spot when it goes, pow, like falling off this table. That's what we refer to as a sharper break. And to a fish, let me tell you, Buck used to describe it like this. said, you may as well put a neon light up there and just flash and saying, here I am, here I am. Sharper break. Fish love them. And even though it was just occurring in this one little spot, I knew it was going to be a key spot. We we're going to fish it. Now we've got some watercolor. And we have a structure situation that I really didn't expect. I didn't expect to see that where I saw it. And I followed it a little bit further, and then all of a sudden, that break line and the drop off turned, made a, an abrupt turn. And that feeder cut, let me just draw it for you here. We're coming up this feeder cut. All of a sudden, the feeder cut goes like that and heads that direction. So, right at that hook, what I call a hook. Normally, if I was fishing for a bass and I had a casting position, that's where I'd anchor the boat and be casting into that hook. The sharper break in the hook. Or I could be sitting up on the shallowest section of that bar and just cast into that sharper break. However, when fishing for a muskie, and this was, after all, a muskie tournament, fishing for muskie, I would much rather have a trolled lure than a cast lure. I don't want to bring my lure up over a spot. I'd because it doesn't give that muskie enough time. The reason I'd rather have a trolled lure in that situation, it was a break line situation to begin with. It was a structure occurrence on a break line. Uh, I, I, but I'd rather have a trolled lure always given a choice because muskies and northern pike, the elongated bodies, they have to get in behind a bait, follow it for a minute or two or a second or two or three or four or five before they can take it. And they just can't react to a bait like a bass. A bass can turn on a dime, bang, and, and hit your lure. But a muskie, northern pike, they can't do that. They got to follow it. So when I have a choice, I'd much rather be trolling than casting for a muskie. So I told Tommy, this is the spot we're going to have to work. And it was getting close to the end of the day because we had traveled so far just looking for something. 
that we wanted to fish. And so, uh, and then we had this big dinner that was scheduled. So we had to get back. So we took our little engine, cranked up, went all the way back. And we felt pretty good about what we had found. We go to this uh, dinner. We have a nice dinner. And then in the gymnasium, they had these four guys that were going to talk. But he introduced me first. He wanted me to lead it off and told all about, you know, he made me sound like I was somebody really smart, you know. And it was great. And I was thinking about Buck thinking, man, this is not what I asked him to do. But here I am in front of 400 people. So, like, I would do if I was just talking to one guy at the corner tavern. We were talking fishing. So I started telling him the truth, like I would always do. I said, one of the first things that you have to understand about a muskie is they're, they school together. Now, this is 1978. They school like all other fish. They school together according to size. And they're very reluctant to move out of their deep water sanctuary zone, which, given the amount of water, if it's available in your lake, will be somewhere between 45 and 55 feet. That's where they spend most all their time. Well, all of a sudden, I had 400 people looking at me like I must be intoxicated or something. They looked at me like I was crazy, like I had totally lost my mind. Back then, everybody thought, you know, that these muskies stake out an area of the weeds and, you know, don't let anybody else in and all this nonsensical stuff you hear, which is totally ridiculous and totally not true. But they're looking at me like I'm nuts. So I figured, well, I have to give them a little more education to get them on the same page with me. So I tried this. I said, one of the things that really hurts a fish, more than anything else, when you look at his environment, what controls a fish, the thing that they can't stand the most is light. The brighter the condition, the more they dislike it. They can't stand light. And a fish's eyes take in like five times more light than ours do. It's like us trying to look directly at the sun. You can't do it. And neither can a fish. And he doesn't have eyelids. He can't close his eyes when things get too bright. So he only has one way to react to this bright light, and that is to drop deep till he reaches a stable condition of light. And in most cases, with a muskie, that's 45 to 55 feet. That's just the way it is. So I ended my talk, and everybody clapped and all of that. But I know from some of the looks that I was getting that they thought I was nuts. <laughs> so... While we're in the midst of this whole deal in this auditorium, all of a sudden we heard what sounded like hail on top of that roof of that auditorium. And it was a corrugated roof. All of a sudden, it's, it's a horrible sound and stuff. We had a nasty cold front coming through, and we hadn't even looked at the weather. That day, as we were searching through that reservoir, it was 75 degrees in September. In Palm de Terre, it was beautiful, sun shining, you know, it was a nice day, and it was warm in the 70s. The next day, well, that cold uh, air came through, the, the low pressure system and the high pressure system was so different. It created a 35 degree drop in temperature from Friday's high to Saturday's high. Saturday's high was in the mid 40s. It was a horrendous cold front. Now we got clear water. We got a lake we've never fished before. We haven't put the first lure in the water. We've got clear water, gene clear water, and we've got the worst front that I'd seen in 10 years. It was horrible. So now we have a tough fishing condition, to say the least. We've got an impossible fishing situation. And so we were really pleased that we had done what we could do to find an area where we may have a chance that one fish might stick his head up. I mean, that's how bad it was. But on the other, on the flip side of that, we pretty much knew that every one of these guys with these 21 foot lunge that were in this tournament, they were going to spend their, their two days. It's a two day tournament, by the way, Saturday and Sunday. They're going to spend their two days fishing the 20-foot weed line. They're going to be fishing inside those weeds with their big lures and the suiks and all the kinds of things that at times will we'll produce a fish. But we knew that that was going to be their mode of operation over the next two days. So we knew 
we had to be downstairs. We had, if we had a chance to catch one stinking fish, it was going to be downstairs. And we had a structure that we could read, a beautiful structure situation that we could read at 45 feet. And at a spot where we had way better watercolor, because we had gone up the reservoir, like Buck says, when it's too clear, too tough, and too all of the other things, move towards the headwaters. We're in a highland situation. Move towards the headwaters, which is what we did. And so we go up there, and we're fishing, and we got a, uh, an 800 on wire fishing at 45 feet. We're trolling this brake line. And where it hooked out, it hooked pretty sharp, and that sharper break was right there. So it was hard to get the lure actually in there right, but we, we decided, okay, we're going to make this pass fall on the brake line, hit that spot, but keep going straight to make sure that we force that lure into that sharper break before we turn the boat and cruise out this side. And then we followed the brake line about another 100 yards up that direction, but we knew the business was back there at the hook, at the sharper break. As soon as our lures got what we felt was, we were pretty comfortable that our lures at that sharper break, pow! I see Tommy's rod just double up. And it doubled up so hard and so quickly, for a second or two, I thought maybe he was hung. He said, nah, it's fish. Oh, stopped the boat immediately. By the time I turned around, that old muskie had come up from 45 feet, pulling all that wire line and that 800 with him and jumped out of the water. Ah, boom. I said, don't let him jump again. Because <laughs> we saw the size of the fish. Well, we're thinking... One fish under this weather condition, one fish has a chance to win. But there's 250 other guys. So, but at the same time, we knew one fish, especially one that looked like that, looked like a 30 pound fish. Uh, and I called it 30 pounds before, before we got it to the boat. When we got to the boat, of course, we had a big net with us that uh, as soon as we got to the boat, we landed that fish and it weighed 28 pounds. And as we're high-fiving each other and so on and so forth, I'm thinking, you know, they only stocked muskies in here 10 years ago. I said, you know, that's about as big as fish as you can expect to find in a 10-year period. 30 pounds would probably be on the outside. That's a big fish, partner. I said, I think, you know, there's a chance we may win a tournament with that fish. So. Uh, I forgot to mention what they had set up. They had set up two different sort of uh, ways of winning the tournament. They had a keep division and then they had a release division. And a release division was that you could find a boat that had, they had flags on these boats that if you wanted to release a fish, you call one of those boats over, they come over, measure the length and the girth while the fish is still in the water, estimate the weight, and then release the fish. Well, we were so far up the reservoir, we didn't see any boats with flags in it. So we're keeping that fish, period. So we put that fish in the boat and we get back to fishing. I can't remember exactly, maybe an hour later. Boom, I hit a fish. Same spot, same exact spot. We're just back and forth. Obviously after the first fish, we're back and forth. And we realized after catching that fish and immediately going back, it wasn't, the school of fish wasn't there, but occasionally a fish might stick his head up, which is what happened. So an hour later, bang, I hit a fish. Brought that fish in, 22 pounds. Okay, so we're thinking now, okay, that's a, a first place maybe and a chance at a second place, you know, so we're going to keep those two fish. And that was it for the rest of that day. We went back in, and we were one of the uh, last boats to go out, so we were one of the last boats to come in to the weigh-in. So when we did the weigh-in, the people... Uh, uh, weighed that first fish, they weighed Tommy's fish, and they went and got another scale. They weighed it two or three different times on two or three different scales. We can't figure out what's going on. We found out why. Because the state record and the lake record, but also the state record at that time was 28 pounds and two ounces. Tommy's fish weighed 28 pounds even. So he missed the state record by two ounces. So we knew we had a chance to win with that fish. I wasn't all that surprised when they said that Tommy's fish was in first place. But I was a little surprised when they said that the 22 pounder, my fish, was in second place. And are you ready for this? 
No one else had caught a fish. The rest of the field had zero fish. Wait a minute. 248 other anglers did not catch one fish. Not one stinking straggler fish from somebody. Well, we found that pretty hard to believe. Well, in a sense, knowing about weather and water and, and the effect of a cold front and, and, and the clear water and all of that, we, were, we weren't really surprised, but we were surprised. You got to figure with 250 guys casting weed, somebody's going to catch a straggler here or there. There's going to be a fish or two somewhere, but not one fish caught. It was absolutely unbelievable. All right, so as, before we went out for day two, Tommy and I had a conversation about how if we happened to catch a fish in the second day, uh, we would probably would be better off to release it. We might have a chance to win both divisions of this if we catch fish tomorrow. So that was our plan. And since I've been so long winded today, I'm going to have to leave day two of the tournament till the next time we talk. And then we'll finish this story. And then I'm going to tell you the effect that this story had on me and on my future fishing and hope that it makes a difference for you. So till the next time we talk, thanks for being with me today. And please like us on Facebook. And whatever you do, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We need you to be a subscriber. And bring your friends along too. Appreciate you. See you next time.